Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Tyler from Valve News Network. How you guys doing today? Ah, just woke up. I'm ready to, uh, I'm ready to, uh, you know, you know. Ugh. Let's play the rest of this developer commentary so I can get the content that I want to make for the developer commentary finished up, you know? I have two videos planned. Uh, one discussing the specifics, um, the specifics that I had learned through, uh, this update, uh, and another one, uh, called In Valve Zone Words. What? What? Welcome to Half-Life Alex. After over 10 years in development, it's our most ambitious game to date. To begin, simply place on a headset simply. Simply. Just do it simply. It's not that hard. So, yeah, I'm working on a video called In Valve's Own Words. Um, I have the audio extracted here. It's 148 items, three hours and four minutes of discussion. Um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what I end up coming up with with that one. Um, so, uh, we're going to get started with all this here in a minute. Um, Tyler, you're looking fresh. That, uh, that Deathloop t-shirt is fire. Thank you, I bought it like a year ago. Um, I've had this Deathloop t-shirt for a while. Um, I'm pretty excited for Deathloop. It was supposed to be out this month, uh, then they delayed it until next year. Uh, it's delayed until May. Um, it's coming out in May. Uh, Steam pre-orders are gonna be going live very soon, which I'm excited about, but, you know. So how's everybody doing? Did you see the players in the CSGO dev thing on SteamDB? I did not, but we're very close to the operation, so it honestly could be any day now. Um, didn't come out yesterday. It's not gonna come out today, so it could be next uh, next week. <laughs> giraffe is back there. Yeah, it's my, that's my roommate's giraffe. He left it here. I don't know what the fuck to do with it. Um, so five players peak game, uh, then they could be testing the uh, cooperative dungeon thing. Um, did you see the Deathloop pre-order bonuses? I did. Yo, Tyler, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm getting, I'm, I'm just, you know. Soup is good. Can we... Can we call him Jeff? No. How's my cat? I have two cats. They're fine. <sighs> I didn't catch all of the stream yesterday. Anything really interesting in the commentary so far? Yeah, um... Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. I, I gotta go through it all again, uh, when I make these, the, the videos, but we need to, like, actually play through it first. Op 10 out this month, it's... You're, it's possible. Tyler, I love you, you fucking clown. I love you too. What are some good games for the quest? Uh, Robo Recall, uh, Quest Z Doom, uh, Lambda VR, Hyper Dash. Virtual Desktop. We are all his friends in our hearts. Tyler, is it true you punched Moonly in the face? No. Uh, Cyberpunk day one bye for you? Um, yeah, whenever that day may be, two years from now. Uh, so, all right, let's uh, get going with this. Where's op 10? Somewhere, it's over there. Uh, let's get VR on. Okay, let's see. We got exclamation point trade in the chat. All set up. We got exclamation point wish in the chat if you want to be able to buy me a game. Really appreciate it if you can. Um, I played some... Reno bought me uh, Yakuza Like a Dragon. And uh, I've played that a lot last night. I'm three hours in. Um, long ass introduction in that game. Like holy shit, a long ass introduction in that game. 
like a long ass introduction in that game. It's funny, like, it took like two hours to get to the point where you got the long hair. Setting up a lot of story for that one. But a lot of people were complaining, in case you don't know, Yakuza Like a Dragon or Yakuza 7 is a completely different kind of game. Yakuza up until this point's a beat-em-up. But this new one is a turn-based RPG. I thought it would be kind of shitty. Like, I thought, like, uh, like, like that seems like it's going to be so much slower. No, it's great. Like, I love it way more. I hope that this is the new way of Yakuza. But I love Yakuza. I love Yakuza 0, uh, Kiwami 1 and 2, you know. And then it's got, you know, like, there's that Ishin Yakuza games. There's two of them where they're, like, old, uh, like, samurai crime bosses and crime families, like, in the old samurai times. And it's like, oh, of course that one's not translated. That one's too cool to get translated, but... But it's really, 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 really good. It's really good. The story, like, there have been Yakuza games in the past where I don't give a shit about the story. Like, Zero has the best story, and this one is not better than Zero's story, period. But, um, this one's story is... It's like, how much shit stuff can we g make the main character go through? <laughs> This motherfucker <laughs> takes the fall for a crime he did not commit to retain the honor of his crime family and goes to prison for 18 years, gets out, and finds out that the crime family that he sacrificed for doesn't exist anymore because the per- It's just like, oh, good God. <laughs> but like, you know. Now the story's picking up, like, they've established all the bullshit and all the shit that they've had to go- Like, all these- the shit that the people have to have to go through. Three hours in, still introducing the story. I'm only on chapter two, three hours in. But, oh my god, this game's really fucking good, though. Um, I've talked about Yakuza quite a bit with Mark Laidlaw, writer of the Half-Life series. Um, we both absolutely love Yakuza, and he was- a little skeptical on if the turn-based game would be any good. I haven't asked him about it, but I've been playing it great. It's fucking great. It's like, it's a turn-based fighting system that's disguised. Well, it, it, if like, it looks like it's in real time because they're still animated and like, like bobbing and weaving and stuff while you fight. It's fucking great. It's so good. So good. That game is amazing. I'm very happy with that game. And also, anybody that gives a shit about Yakuza, I was a little... I was a little skeptical that they were changing, like... You, not only were they changing the like the main fighting style from like a real-time beat-em-up kind of thing to a turn-based RPG, but they also changed the main character. Right? So, like, up until now, Yakuza has always been about... Uh, fucking... Of course I forget, I forget his name. Uh, yeah, Kazuma Ki Ki Kiru. Yeah, Kazuma-san. It's this new guy who looks like Eric Andre, and I'm not the only person to have noticed that. Um, it's this, yeah, Kiru. But it's this new guy that I fucking love that they, like, write off like their their reason for him not existing anywhere in the previous series is because he's spent the last 18 years in prison oh man yeah then you got yeah but this new one yeah like a dragon yakuza like a dragon yeah ichi-san his name's ichiban which i think means store in japanese his name is store but dude this guy's fucking cool. Like, the beginning of the game introduces him as like, yeah, I'm a Yakuza, but I have a heart of gold and I give a sh- like, you know, like there's this little side quest at the very beginning of the game where, um, you know, one of the people that work for your crime family was peddling fake porn, just, just blank VHS tapes to high school kids. Um, 
And he's like, fuck that. What the fuck are you doing? Not only are we going to beat the shit up, beat the shit out of this guy for doing that. A, even attempting to sell porn to children. But B, scamming the kids in the first place. C, we're going to take the money that you made from that and give it back to the kids. And then he goes on a bill collection and realizes like, yeah, you owe on your debt, but you're working really, really hard, so we're not gonna make your life any harder. And he takes a beating from his family's treasurer for it, but he's it's just like, oh, wow, this guy's super nice. And he's like, in my heart, the Yakuza is a crime family, but we're supposed to do, we're like, we're doing what the government won't do, and we're trying to make the world a better place. And then he takes the fall for a crime he didn't commit. He spends 18 years in prison, and he doesn't look a day older, and it's just like, ugh, so good. Play the damn game. Such a great game. Holy shit. <laughs> oh, man. That story affected, like, oh, and they give, ah, uh, fuck. I don't want to spoil too much of the story from what I've played so far, but seriously, Yakuza Like a Dragon, fucking great-ass game. Fucking great-ass game. What's happening with Deathloop? Arcane is still working on it. They delayed it until May. Very excited for Deathloop. All right, let's, no more stalling. Play some Half-Life Alex. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, when I'm done with work today, I'm going to be playing more Yakuza. Maybe I'll stream some of it. I, I have... I don't know if I can because I take an HDMI cable and plug it into this TV, which is a 4K television, and this game is optimized really, really well because I'm only running a 2080 and I can run 4K 60 maxed out on my computer. So I've been playing it in 4K uh, using my computer. Who the fuck needs an Xbox? Uh, I still want a 3080 when they're available. Uh, I data mines the developer commentary update. It's literally just the sound effects. The sound files, three hours of sound files. <laughs> um, and if, yeah, if you want to play a beat em up Yakuza, play Zero. Yakuza Zero is. It's on the PC. It's, it's fucking. Oh my god, such a great game. And then another game that's similar to Yakuza in style. Um, what's that one? It's not a Japanese crime family, it's a Chinese crime family. Ah, uh, what's that game? It's fucking great. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's not, it's a beat em up. It's, it's a bit, Sleeping Dogs. Another amazing fucking game. It's so great. That one is also very, very good. It's a completely different kind of game. Sleeping Dogs takes itself way more seriously than Yakuza. Yakuza knows that it's funny and kind of weird. Sleeping Dogs is trying to tell a very serious story, but it's still a very good game. Don't fucking wacky, shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up! <laughs> Hi, I'm in class right now. Hi, class. Hi, I'm in class right now. I'm Tyler. <laughs> and Sleeping Dogs is another good one. What do you know about procedural generation in the Source Engine? Can it be uh, implemented? I'm sure it can. Um, just not very well. All right, I just gushed about... Um, All right, have I finished? I don't give a shit about Breaking Bad. Sorry. I just don't. All right. Let's play some VR. <laughs> yeah, The Outer Worlds finally came out on Steam. And I am 30 hours into my first Steam playthrough, and I haven't even started the DLC yet. I didn't even know there was 30 hours of content in the base game. I somehow found it. Love the Outer Worlds. I did a data mine of the Outer Worlds and found, like, here's a fun story. The second DLC is not out until, like, six months from now. Uh, I'm fairly certain if I can get the console reintroduced into the game, I can launch the full DLC right now because there's, like, 20 hours of dialogue just d recorded through a text-to-speech program that just spoils the entire second DLC for the Outer Worlds. And then I have all the maps and all the items, like it's all just sitting in the game right now. And I extracted all of it, and I'm, g I'm working on a report for Bethesda News Network for that. 
it runs in Unreal Engine 4. None of the things that say they reintroduced the, the dev console have worked for me. But I'm positive an early version of the, um, uh, the DLC is sitting in the game right now. And the second DLC isn't even officially announced, so I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's launch Half-Life Alex. Are CSGO skins ever leaked along with maps for operations? Almost never. Almost never. That's not really how leaks work. We learn things through code, not through assets at Valve, especially community-generated assets. All right, where did we leave off? Where did we leave off? <laughs> can you turn off the Eli video call TVs? Oh, you can turn. Oh, yeah, I know. Any comments or photos of city and soundscape inspirations for the commentary yet? No. Uh, just after the Eli scene, I think, or never mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, no. Uh, we ended. Don't forget to take a step back and pick up your knife. Yeah, we uh, we were in the Northern Star. We were about we we were about to free the Vortigaunt from. Yeah, that's where we were. We were about to free the Vortigaunt. So that is map. It's, it's, it's hotel interior rooftop, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> also, did you see Clix Phillips uploads of the dev commentary in order with names? Yes. Um, kind of what I want to do with it. Uh, but not exactly. Um, you'll see what I want to do with it when I do it. Okay, commentary is enabled. It is noon. <laughs> All right. Can you see the game? I can't tell. All right. All right, can you guys hear me? Oh, right, I gotta turn on OVR toolkit. Hold on. Otherwise I won't be able to see you guys. So you can see in here, everything looks okay. All right, let's get going. Now, I'm just gonna quickly get to the part that I was at. All right, man, I love this game. I love VR. All right, we've already been here. We got to get to the part that we were actually at, which was further in the level. Okay. 
All right, so I'd say we're about here. This is probably where we were at, so let's... Oh, no, we actually went down this hallway, too. Yep. Is the frame rate bad? That was good yesterday. How long has it been since I graduated high school or college? Last four. Frame rate's okay. Frame rate's good. Alright, don't fuck with me on that. We actually had the uh, SMG, as far as I recall. So we just need to get through this bit. <laughs> Alex, it's your lucky day. That combine weapon's unbonded. How are you sure? Still in the case. They never leave them in the case. Nice. I didn't even need to edit your genetic code. I know. You love that. That's okay. There'll be a next time. Alright. Look at that, it lights up the dirt. Ah, fuck. It's still in the case. They never leave them in the case. Fuck it. Worst part of the game, that is. Alrighty. Alright, this is where we were at. Okay. A common game design problem is that of recent Adrian, where is Underlord Season 2? Players have just left an area where they acquired the Combine submachine gun, and whenever they get a new weapon, we try to give the player the opportunity to experiment with it right away. So, right after the SMG, we make sure to give the player a bunch of ammo for it and a supply of not too threatening enemies in the form of confined zombies and wandering headcrabs experiment on. But playtesting has shown us that there's a wide range of ways that players respond to that setup. Some shoot a head grab or two and move on, but some players take their time exploring the weapon, even using up all the ammunition we gave them. Now, after the head grabs, the player is heading towards a new area, which features one of the hardest combat arenas in the game, where they must fight two revivers at the same time. How much ammunition can we expect the player to have here? How much should we put in this area between the two arenas to ensure all players will have enough to fight the two revivers. If we don't put in enough, player may be in a position where they cannot succeed at the upcoming encounter and reloading their save games won't help them. They will need to go back and replay the previous area, 
this time conserving more ammo. That's not something we want to happen, nor is it something that we can expect all players to realize. Instead, many will repeatedly try and fail to be the two revivers. So, at its core, the problem with resource placement is that the dynamic range of resources carried by players can be significant, and it gets even wider as the game progresses. In Half-Life Alex, we would see some players end the game with barely any ammunition, while other players had okay, over 1,000 unused rounds. <clears throat> So how can we handle resource placement? Dan Ross Paulson. Why dynamic range? My favorite collection and usage patterns. Like many games, we opted for a dynamic system that looks at the player's current resource counts and makes decisions based on them. But the design of these kinds of systems can be tricky because they tend to affect player behavior. For instance, in Half-Life 2, we placed breakable crates throughout the game which dynamically spawned resources based on the player's current health and ammo levels. This had the advantage of allowing us to not need a huge amount of playtesting for resource balancing, because as long as there were enough crates around, the player would always have enough resources. But because that system exists, we didn't have to spend much time on resource placement, and as a result, we didn't really craft challenges around resource collection. Players also learned that they didn't need to really care about their resource levels, because the crates were always going to top them up on whatever they needed most. For Half-Life Alex, we wanted to revisit those assumptions, we knew that searching for resources in a VR environment was something players really enjoyed. So we wanted resource collection to be something players needed to do throughout the entire game. And that meant we didn't want them to ever reach the point where they had so much ammo and health that they didn't need to explore. We were also able to start playtesting earlier in the product development cycle than we had been able to when making Half-Life 2, which gave us the confidence that we'd be able to spend the time we needed to carefully place every resource. For Half-Life Alex, we moved to a system that allows us to craft a more specific experience. My favorite! A layer that attempts to reduce the dynamic range of resource gathering between players. Instead of placing generic resources that switch types, level designers carefully placed each resource type throughout the world. Some are easy to find, and some are more difficult. Then, as the player moves forward in the world, the system opportunistically removes resources in the path ahead based on the player's current resource levels. This had the benefit of allowing level designers to have a lot of control over the player's resource amounts in different areas of the game. They were able to craft areas where they wanted the player to be starved of one ammo type or encouraged to use another. For example, in this area, designers could provide enough ammo to ensure that the player would have enough to fight two revivers, with the knowledge that the ammo balancing system would remove much of it if the player was already loaded up. We could safely give the players a large amount of combined SMG ammo in the previous arena and know that the players who ran past the poison head crabs without firing a shot wouldn't find more here. There are a number of additional features to address complexities that result from this system, such as ensuring players always find something inside a combine locker, or ensuring that players are still rewarded for searching carefully and regularly, even if they're carrying a lot of ammo. Ultimately, we want a player who is paying more attention to the environment to come out ahead resource-wise. We just needed some dials to be able to control how far ahead they got. Scratch. All right. Up until this point, each Reviver encounter has been focused on teaching players something new about the Reviver so that they can defeat it. This arena represents the culmination of the training. There are no new rules, there is nothing to learn about the Reviver itself. By this point, players are armed with the knowledge required to progress. The challenge then shifts into a combat problem where strategy and execution are required. Players have to juggle and prioritize multiple targets, utilize all of their weapons and manage a constrained supply of ammunition in order to prevail and make their way back out to the exterior of the hotel so they can deactivate the combined substation. Hey Valve, uh, little, little note on the reviver. Uh, it should be louder. Can we make it louder? This, this, this attack right here, I feel like what it's missing is something so absurdly loud that I can't even hear myself fucking think. You know what I mean? It, 
It's it's it needs to be louder, guys. Here, I can't even hear these attacks. We gotta make it louder. Um, just so I know for the people watching, can you even hear that attack? It's like, I, if I didn't see it, I wouldn't know it was happening. That's how quiet it is. Where's... Did that dog come back again, Alex? Yeah, this one was kind of rough. You're all right, though, right? Yeah, Russ. I'm good. Well, we've got to get you out of here and up to the roof. I'm working on it. Also, another note. Love these orb puzzles, guys. I think probably the thing the game was missing was I think you needed more hacking puzzles. Do you think there's a commentary note about somebody being upset that they had to cut some of the hacking puzzles? Because I'd believe it. I don't think Tyler can see chat currently. Oh, you know what? I can't. I do actually freaking love those orb puzzles. You're a dumbass. I, I didn't know my viewers could be so dumb. Can I get some shotgun ammo, please? Ah, three! I hate this!
You know, I'd really love some shotgun ammo, guys. What difficulty are we playing on? Yeah, I want it on easy for this. All right. Here One of the core subplots of Mike! the storyline is regarding the Combine imprisonment and use of the Vortigaunts to trap the G-Man. The multi-dimensional power of the Vortigaunts to detain the seemingly invincible G-Man is established in previous Half-Life lore. Through the use of their prisoner pods and substation technology, the Combine extract the power of the Vortigaunts' Vortessence chant, tune that energy, and then transmit it to the vault to continue. This is my the favorite bit. To communicate this combine process to the player without explaining it through lengthy exposition, right. we now used musical sound to patterns powerful. to represent the process implicitly. If you stand near the pods holding the vortigaunts, you can hear them groaning their chant in a slow but semi musical pattern. Just past the pods is the resonator, okay. within which you can hear a enemy. distilled version of the chant energy. Finally, the cables are activated with the concentrated Vortigaunt energy which is harmonized in varying patterns and intermittently transmitted to the vault once the energy is sufficiently tuned. If you stand near the cables while they're tuning, you'll notice the sheer size and height of the sound. This was achieved by placing the sound emitters for each cable at the locations the of the friends. actual the cables up. themselves. The sound of the cables the covers a broad frequency you range, which emphasizes no Steam way. Audio's head-related transfer function processing. That simulation, combined with the feedback of the observer's they inner not. ear as she looks <clears> upwards, <throat> gives the same impression of scale that VR is known Clear to give visual the objects. Mike, I love you. There is no distance between us. Are you done talking, Mike? Character performance within a yes. VR game has a unique set of opportunities and challenges. In our efforts to keep control in the hands of the player, we must create a performance that is interesting enough to maintain players' attention, but flexible enough to allow for player freedom. This scene has the most face-to-face -face interaction in the game, and there is no physical barrier between the player and the Vortigaunt when he first appears. At one point, we played with the idea of a jump scare when the Vortigaunt is released, upending the player's expectations of what had been referred to only as a battery up until that point. Not only was it a bit ham-fisted, but the Vortigaunt came flailing out of the pod, frequently into the same space occupied by the player. To solve this problem, we cut the jump scare and slid the pod back out of the player's space as it opened, to allow for the Vortigaunt to emerge at a comfortable distance. We face a similar challenge when determining how to get both the player and Vortigaunt to their next locations without intersecting. We wanted to get the player and Vortigaunt side by side overlooking the vista, while the Vortigaunt delivered critical exposition. It would have been awkward for the player and Vortigaunt to take the same route along the catwalk, so we looked at other options, including exploring ways that the Vortigaunt may have once moved in its native environment. With long forearms, it's feasible that the Vortigaunts may have moved around as quadrupeds, so we chose an agile four-legged scramble up to the higher platform where he can deliver exposition without contending with the player for space. Hell yeah! That's my favorite stuff I've been learning about so far. We're putting a lot of trust in that Vortigaunt to shut down all the substations. I... I trust him. Yes, me too. Uh, because if he doesn't... Well, that vault isn't going anywhere, and we'll be standing there with no vault to break into, surrounded by combine. Russ, trusting him is our only plan here. He'll do this. We can do this. Yes, you're right. He'll be fine. We're all going to be fine. Well, 
While developing Half-Life Alex, we Houston. had a large number of people in many disciplines contributing to a relatively small number of maps. This meant that we frequently had multiple people working on the same map at the same time. One way that we managed this complexity was to break our maps into smaller pieces referred to as prefabs. Prefabs! A prefab could be built out of the same types of geometry, logic, enemies, particle systems, or any other elements as a regular map. As long as people were working in separate prefabs, they could make changes or additions without stepping on each other's work. A prefab could contain a large physical space like this whole street scene, or it could contain only a handful of elements. Large prefabs that partitioned a map... Fuck. Hold on. We were learning about prefabs! Where'd it go? While developing Half-Life Alex, Fuck. we had a large number of people in many disciplines contributing to a relatively small number of maps. This meant that we frequently had multiple people working on the same map at the same time. One way that we managed this complexity was to break our maps into smaller pieces referred to as prefabs. A prefab could be built out of the same types of geometry, logic, enemies, particle systems, or any other elements as a regular map. As long as people were working in separate prefabs, they could make changes or additions without stepping on each other's work. A prefab could contain a large physical space like this whole street scene, or it could contain only a handful of elements. Large prefabs that partitioned a map to allow for collaboration were essential for a project of this scope. But many small, reusable prefabs were created for Half-Life Alex as well. A good example of this was the set of reusable vehicle prefabs used here and throughout the game. Each vehicle was authored as a configurable prefab, enabling designers to quickly place them around the game, setting a few parameters to customize the vehicle for the context. Parameters include things like the vehicle's paint color, the amount of pre-existing damage, whether the doors were open or simply missing, and the type of ammunition or other resources the vehicle might contain. This sped up our workflow and also meant that updates to a prefab were automatically propagated out to all of the maps that used it. The tarps used by the Combine to cover buildings in the quarantine zone are animated procedurally. This animation was added relatively late in development, so it needed to be both computationally inexpensive and technologically conservative, so no new systems. Simple overlapping waveforms are used to displace the tarp geometry where it hangs loosely away from the building. The displacements are oriented along the wind direction, and their propagation direction is further modified by the gradients of a texture we refer to as a freedom of motion map. This map is derived from the shape of the building geometry under the tarp, and is used to attenuate the displacement so that the tarp won't animate in places where it is meant to be pulled tight against the building. The result is a flapping tarp that seems to conform to its surroundings and responds appropriately to the wind. This used to be called the tenements, even though they called it what? the 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 Zen Hotel or something? Hotel Zen? In the files, Northern Star was originally just called Tenements. This was an apartment building, uh, as far as the lore was concerned. And we have an early version of this entire map that was accidentally leaked by a Valve employee in the, um, the tools. The Combine Soldier you see here won't fight you. It's been programmed to run back and forth along the path shown on the ground, in order to illustrate the stride retargeting system developed for Half-Life Alex, Okay. One of the challenges of animating digital characters is making sure that their feet don't slide along the ground as they move. Humans are very good at picking out irregularities in the movements of virtual characters, especially in VR, and Combine soldiers in particular need to look like their feet are planting and their weight is shifting as they change direction. Otherwise, they appear weightless and unconvincing. In a pre-processing phase, our stride retargeting system analyzes the steps of each authored animation and stores them as a direction-independent trajectory. At runtime, our system predicts where each foot will land on the next step based on the motion of the animation, the character's path, and the height of the ground. The pairs of colored boxes on the ground illustrate this process. The red boxes show the previous foot positions, the green boxes indicate the soldier's current foot position, and the blue boxes are drawn where each foot is predicted to land next. Once the predicted foot positions are calculated, the system guides the feet to the predicted locations using the trajectory information to preserve the style of the original animation. Once the foot lands, it is locked in place until the next step. In the end, this system was so effective that we could essentially make any animation walk in any direction without foot sliding. 
You can experiment with the system by moving around the area, since the soldier has been set up to always face you while running the specified path. Neat. You've almost got it. Do I? Do I almost got it? Alec gets electrocuted, and the game immediately ends. Roll credits. Engineer gaming! Oh, that should come in handy. Yeah, shouldn't it? Shut the fuck up. Yeah, they also know how to how to murder. Do you guys think I'm good at Half-Life Alex? My value as a human is 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 based on if you guys think I'm good at Half-Life Alex. Crowded down here, Russ. Com channel's gone crazy since we took out that substation. They know we're after the vault now. Whatever's in there, they really, really don't want us to have it. Now I just want it more. Now that's the spirit. Ow! Taking advantage. I bet you guys think three clicks Philip is better at Half Life Alex than I am. We're sworn enemies. Me and Philly. Me and my cute little Philly. We're sworn enemies. Nice. Seven two days in a row. Twitch Prime works in mysterious ways. Okay. Well, thank you for the Bastard. subs. Where's the next commentary node? Where's the next commentary node? I'm looking for a girlfriend. 
You know what they say, no chest, no sex. What's your favorite piece of lore that Alex added to the Half-Life franchise? Uh, well, the stuff they didn't use, actually. The, the Combine Sympathizer faction. That's my favorite bit of lore, because I think that's fucking interesting. Especially in today's political climate. Steady! Look out below! The what? Yeah, the Combine Sympathizer faction. Trip mines have appeared in prior Half-Life games, and the act of defusing them seemed like a natural fit for a VR game, where players can perform complex operations with their hands. Did that? By this point in the game, players have already learned how to hack Combine technology with their multi-tool, but we wanted defusing a trip mine to be more tense than the hacking puzzles. To defuse a trip mine, not only does the player have to place their hand near the laser that could trigger the mine, but they have to perform the task within just a few seconds. Early versions of this puzzle were inspired by lockpicking, resembling a series of tumblers that the player had to quickly align. Hey, we have that! Unfortunately, the tumbler design required players to rotate their wrists in an uncomfortable manner, particularly given that they had to also avoid touching the laser beam. We removed the rotational component, but kept the timing element, leading to the mechanic you see in the final game. We also experimented with causing the trip mines to actually explode if the player failed to defuse them, but most players found this too punishing, especially in cases where a chain reaction of explosions could occur. Instead, the mines just stay active and the player can attempt to defuse them again. We did end up keeping this behavior for the hard difficulty setting, but added a warning sound a few seconds before the mine actually explodes, to give players some time to move away. We also experimented with allowing diffused mines to be removed and redeployed by the player, but we hadn't designed enough combat scenarios around this mechanic for it to be satisfying in practice. So this was left out of the final game. Well, we actually have both of those cut elements. The lockpicking minigame just sits in the game right now. Um, and the ability to reuse trip mines also just sits in the game. So, that's cool. Thank you, Tajeev. This combat arena that loops back over itself as the player winds through the tenement buildings was one of the earliest test maps built when we began adding combine soldiers to Half-Life Alex. Tenement! One of the lessons we learned from this series of combat encounters was that fighting combine soldiers was physically taxing on players as we needed to pay careful attention to pacing. Taking cover, reloading, switching weapons, and acquiring targets really pushed on all the skills that players had learned up until this point. To help cut down on fatigue, we added gaps between the combine encounters and removed some of the combat altogether to better pace the experience. You can find some of the that combat in the, the stairwell files following still. this battle are a good example of one of the pacing elements we used to slow the player down and let them recuperate before the combat ramps back up again. Thank you, Corey Peters. Russ, are they saying my name? Yeah, that's not good. So maybe it's the hotel has always been a hotel and the bits after are the tenements? Huh. Okay. Bogus, what seems to be the problem? Three shells left. Yeah, 
Yeah, low frames are the fault of the stream. Exactly. Is it low frames right now? It was an interesting challenge for artists and level designers to employ environmental storytelling to paint a picture of what may have happened inside the walls of the quarantine zone. Just like the hotel, these apartments have been overrun by Zen foliage and are filled with people's belongings, abandoned in haste. In this area, the walls have been torn down, either by destructive portal storms or perhaps the combined Ooh. cleanup effort. Barrels of fluid used by workers to try and treat or contain the Zen growth have been left behind, and it would appear that the cleanup efforts have either failed or been abandoned. By not explaining every facet of the world, we leave players with the opportunity to imagine for themselves the bigger picture of life in City 17. The walls are possibly down because of portal storms. That's cool. Is that John Lennon? Oh, hi. Last one. So that's implying there's been many other portal storms that we haven't actually seen in the game. Very interesting. Well, I mean, portal storms, that's how Eli lost his leg, right? It was a portal storm. Or is that not canon? Last shout. Bull squid is cannon. Okay. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say that, right? Alex. Okay. Mark said it was a bull squid. Okay. Yeah, Eli Maxwell. Yeah. Yeah, episode two does start with a portal storm. Now, is the commentary disabled? Because I just reloaded a save. It was an interesting challenge for artists and level designers to employ environmental storytelling to paint a picture of what may have happened inside the walls of the quarantine zone. Just like the hotel, these apartments have been overrun by Zen foliage and are filled with people's belongings, abandoned in haste. In this area, the walls have been torn down, either by destructive portal storms or perhaps the Combine's cleanup effort. Barrels of fluid used by workers to try and treat or contain the Zen growth have been left behind. Russell, put Dad on. 
Abby! Baby! Dad! We just took down a substation. Good. Because when they move this thing, that weapon's gone. We need to get it tonight. Once we had the spine of the game complete, teams went through the maps looking for additional opportunities to add the character and tone that players associate with the Half-Life games. This mannequin head grab was a fun opportunity to hit on the sci-fi horror B-movie vibe. We had a few conversations about how long to leave the head grab atop the mannequin, and decided that the experience should be analogous to catching a small dog in the middle of some mischief. We wanted players to feel like they had walked in on something they weren't supposed to see, and for them to go away feeling like every inch of the game contained something for them to find if they chose to explore it. After an early update to the headcrab sounds where details like breathing and grunting were added for the first time, we received feedback that the new sounds were too cute and familiar, moving the headcrab too far in the direction of a cuddly creature rather than an alien threat. We updated the sounds to be more threatening, but for th Okay. We updated the sounds to be more threatening, but for this headcrab, we brought back some of the cuter sounds to sell the headcrab's frustration with the mannequin. In order to reduce the amount of reloading required in the heat of battle, we wanted players to be able to upgrade the pistol by increasing its ammo capacity. That might seem like a small change, but implementing it in a way that was intuitive to players and that didn't have a lot of negative side effects was surprisingly tricky to get right. Our initial mechanic for increasing the ammo capacity was to use double-sized clips. Mm -hmm. Once the pistol was upgraded, the player's backpack held clips with twice as many bullets, and those were represented by a clip model that was twice as long. But unfortunately, the longer clips Still presented a lot of distracting fictional problems. For one, they looked ridiculous protruding out of the bottom of the pistol. Players were also left wondering what was going on in their backpack to transform the single-capacity clips that they put in there into the double capacity versions that they were pulling out. We were also left with the sort of absurd implication that the pistol clips found in the world now magically all had to be the upgraded double sized versions. And while we did scrap the double sized clips, the concept was still enticing. We just needed to find a better metaphor. So then we started looking at the hoppers that were used on paintball guns that could store large amounts of paintballs. In fact, the final upgrade that resulted from this whole line of thinking is still internally referred to as the bullet hopper. So with this in mind, we next needed to design an intuitive interaction model. Players were already satisfied with our existing pistol interaction loop, which was eject clip, insert the next one, chamber, and then shoot. So we wanted to preserve these skills that players were already beginning to master. So players would still reload the gun as before, but small mechanical prongs would steal bullets from the inserted clip, pull them into the hopper, and then place them into the firing chamber as needed. Audio cues were also added to clearly communicate the state of the hopper loading process. The hopper also impacted the visual design that we used to convey the state of the pistol. Originally, the clips themselves had a numerical counter indicating the number of bullets remaining. And on its own, this was fine, and players understood it easily. But the readout on the bullet hopper was on the opposite side of the pistol, and had a pattern of blue dots indicating the amount of bullets remaining. So these two representations in two different locations made it difficult for players to quickly determine the total number of bullets in the upgraded gun. To solve this, we designed a single visual readout on the side of the pistol grip. It structurally matched the state of a pistol clip, the pistol's bullet chamber, and the bullet hopper if the upgrade was acquired. All that stuff is still sitting in the files. Wait, do I just get to keep the reservoir now because you put it on my gun? Okay. I didn't buy it. I'm pretty sure they're mags though, right? Looking very deadly. I'm out. I love the laser sight. I think it's so fucking clever.
How's Dad doing? Does he seem okay? Oh, he, he's fine, Alex. He's working away over there. Good. Oh, thanks. Oh, he is missing a leg, though. Yeah. You know, he was missing a leg before. Right. Well, it's, it's still gone. Thanks, Russ. Sure thing. Seeing that? The Vortigons are taking down the bus station! Yes! This is my work! Deploy Demand! Tyler ain't reading chat. Will I check out the console command for realistic ladders? Yeah, eventually. It's generally a requirement that all new enemy types have a section of the game designed to introduce them. We rarely build the introduction early on in the process, though, because it's often through playtesting that we learn exactly what aspects of the new enemy need to be highlighted in the introduction. In addition to understanding the capabilities of a new enemy, we also find introductions help solidify the very existence of the new enemy type in the player's mind. Without an explicit introduction, we sometimes find that playtesters confuse multiple enemy types, mm. inflating them in their minds. This was the case with the Suppressor the class of soldier that's designed to pin a player behind cover while other soldiers advance on them. The Suppressor is an inversion of the previous soldier classes, who've all focused on trying to push players out of cover. The Suppressor introduction stretches across the next two rooms. In the first, players see the Suppressor firing at zombies, giving the player a moment to safely observe its firing behavior. They also get to hear its associated sounds, which are important to learn for future encounters. Mm. In the second room, players learn to fight the Suppressor themselves. This is relatively straightforward when the suppressor is alone, but will become more involved in later arenas where we combine the suppressor with other soldier types. Cool. Is the frame rate bad or? The stream is supposed to be at 60, but if my computer can't hold up to it, you know, playing VR and streaming at 1080 60 at the same time, exclamation point. Donate in the chat. Help me buy a better computer that can handle it. Because I'm, I'm playing at 90. And as far as I can tell, the frame rate is fine in-game. It's generally a requirement that it isn't practical to spend development time or art resources evenly across every part of the game, 
so we rely on strategic reuse of resources to maintain fidelity and specificity across the game's environments. This space was initially constructed using industrial models and textures seen throughout many previous environments. To set it apart, we added the large cables and vortigaunt pods to imply a makeshift combine power plant whose purpose was to transmit energy to the substations. The juxtaposition of this abandoned industrial space with the large combine cables created enough visual interest to make the space feel meaningful at a relatively low cost. The cable motif was subsequently added to other parts of the game to increase visual interest and give the player a sense of being led toward the vault. It may not be obvious, but the cables exiting through the ceiling here continue on to the exterior of the building, across the large construction courtyard, and over the roof of the distillery building, presumably continuing on to a substation or other combine infrastructure. Players may not notice that continuation, but such details help guide us in building a world that feels connected and consistent. Cool. I don't need you. Fuck off. Play at lower settings? Yeah, okay. Which, uh, which settings? left. Wow, I'm having real bad tracking problems too. Next left. One problem we faced with the VR movement styles that Alex supported was keeping the combat experience from diverging based upon whether players were using teleport or continuous movement. If the combat was significantly different depending on the player's movement setting, our playtesting requirements could explode combinatorially. One way that we prevented this combinatorial explosion was by ensuring that AIs could sense player movement no matter which locomotion style the player was using. To do this, we created a visual proxy for players using teleport locomotion. 
Imagine a scenario where the player is behind cover, hidden from a soldier's sight. If the player used continuous movement to run to another piece of nearby cover, the soldier would see them while they were out in the open. But a player who instantly teleported from one piece of cover to the next would not be seen. To solve this discrepancy, when a player teleports, we leave a breadcrumb trail of invisible visual proxies, which the enemy AI can see. These proxies pass information I do not have to RTX the AI, voice similar on. to what it would have gathered from seeing the player perform the movement directly. In this case, the soldier would know the teleporting player had left the original cover and run across open ground to the new cover, just like a player using continuous motion. While obviously not identical, in that the soldier didn't have a chance to take a shot at the teleporting player, these kinds of features did allow us to reduce the number of ways our AI logic needed to take player movement options into consideration. Cool. All right, we'll figure it out then. Let's do this. All right, I'm gonna try and figure this out. Um, we'll be right back.